all right, let's take a look at 45. So we'll start with this, and then I think you said 47, right, is the next one? Yeah. All right. A radioactive nucleus at, nucleus at rest decays into a second nucleus, an electron, and a neutrino, which means there's three particles as a result. The electron and the neutrino are emitted at right angles and have momentum given as the following, respectively. Determine the magnitude and direction of the second recoiling nucleus. Okay. So the third part, pretty much, is what they're saying, right? Yeah. Um, now, one of the things right off the bat, Jack, that might be annoying, but true, is you're probably, let's see, yeah, you're going to need to, I think, know the masses of these. Yeah. So, let's see. And also, I'm not really sure what are emitted at right angles actually means. Ah, uh, okay. Right angles to one another. So, let's That's start with the diagram means. then. So, here's the original nucleus. And it is splitting into an electron, a neutrino, uh, a radioactive nucleus, a second nucleus, an electron, and a neutrino. So that means that the second nucleus has to go in some angle in this direction. Yeah. Okay, and that's only because I know the electron and the neutrino both go in the directions given in the diagram. Now, had I drawn the neutrino the other direction, right? Had I drawn the neutrino this way, then the second nucleus would be coming back that way. And the rationale behind my argument there is that if I'm going north and east with two particles, the third particle that balances the momentum of the first two has to be southwest. Now, I don't know what the angle is. I have no idea, right? But I know that this is the theta value right there that we're looking at. So whenever yeah. you see right angles, my recommendation is that you make one of them along the Y and one along the X axis. Because you could technically have done like the electron this way, right? And the neutrino this way, but then that would be just really messy. Why would you want to have to deal with that? Because this would then have an X and Y component. This would have an X and Y component. Whereas this is all on the Y and this is all on the X. Does that make sense why I'm orienting it that way? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's what I know so far. And the question is asking us, uh, we have their, oh, we have their momenta. Oh, interesting. Okay. So we don't have the velocity of the electron or the neutrino. We don't have the mass of the electron or the neutrino, but we have its momentum. And if we look at the last part, it says determine the magnitude and direction of the momentum of the second nucleus. So they're giving us the MV values, that quantity M times V for both of these actually. Yeah. Do you see that by the units what I'm talking about there? Yeah. Okay, so these values here are not mass and they are not velocity, they are m times v. So the way I'd approach this is I'd look at the x direction and look at the y direction. I would say before the explosion, is anything moving? No, we're not told that the, uh, it actually says, yeah, it's at rest actually, we're, we're stated at rest here. So it's not moving. So before the collision, the momentum in the x is zero and the momentum in the y is zero before the collision. And we always do, you know, before, equals after, right? Before equals after. That's our governing formula. I don't really need to write that down anymore now that we're at this point of the chapter, but we're looking at the x and the y direction separately. Now, after the explosion, only the neutrino goes in the x direction, according to my diagram at least, right? The neutrinos, let's see, momenta, Electrons respectively. So the neutrino, let me use another color actually. Let's go ahead and use this color right here. Okay. So that's the actual momentum in orange of the neutrino. I don't know why it's crossed out. I didn't mean to cross that out. Okay. So we're going to use that value in the x direction. So we're going to have the MV of the neutrino after the explosion, we are gonna have zero momentum from the electron because it's only going in the y direction. And we're going to have the second nucleus times the cosine of theta. And if we carefully think about this, that nucleus is gonna go to the left and down. So this number will be a negative quantity. So I can already put a negative value there and assume that the V in this equation is the speed, not the momentum, but again, not the velocity. But again, they're not even asking us for the speed, right? They're saying determine the magnitude and direction of the momentum of the second nucleus. So see how I'm writing MV for these. We're writing MV because we're used to writing MV, 
But instead of writing MV, I could have just said like, okay, zero equals the momentum of the neutrino plus the momentum of the electron minus the momentum of the second nucleus times the cosine of theta. Why am I using cosine theta for the second nucleus? Well, because down here, the second nucleus, well, it's moving at an angle. It's not moving only to the left. It's not moving only down. It's got to be moving at an angle. And I know that because if the electron is moving up, then part of the second nucleus has to be moving down. If the neutrino is moving right, then part of the second nucleus has to be moving left in order for there to be a state of balance here because there's no net force acting. So that would be my equation for the x direction actually. And I would recommend that the second line is used actually because it's a lot easier. Why use mv if you're not given m and you're not given v, just use p instead, okay? Now in the y direction, it's gonna pretty much look like the same thing except after the collision, which of these particles is moving now in the y direction? Um, the electron. Yeah, electron. yeah. so it's gonna be the electron's momentum minus the momentum of the second nucleus times now sine theta. So it becomes a system of equations really in the end. So I'm gonna erase this first line from the x direction because we don't need it. I'm gonna slide this up actually here. Let's move this a little bit so you can see it. And now we have a system of equations, right? A system of equations. Remember the method I taught you guys in class when it gets to this point where you have cosines and sines and all of your unknowns are in the same location? What did I say you could do? I said you could do a couple things here. Um, in general, yeah, what, what could you do? Use the eliminate elimination or substitution. Yeah, so you wanna think about your methods of solving. Substitution would definitely work. Um, elimination would only work if you did what? You can't add the equations together to eliminate. You can't subtract them. Uh, divide. Yeah, this is yeah. the one time I said that you can divide equations and it might be useful, right? So if you wanna divide either the X or the Y by the other one, what'll happen is PSN will cancel out. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is to move everything else over. So this will become, so in the X direction, let's slide PSN over to the left side. And in the Y direction, let's slide it over. And now if we divide equations, it's a lot more obvious because we divide the right-hand sides and we divide the left-hand sides. So dividing the left-hand sides, I'm gonna do, I'll do y over x. Why am I doing y over x? Um, so you can get tan with the uh, trig. Exactly, if I did x over y, what do I get? You guys know what cosine over sine is? I guess it would be um, cotangent. Good, cotan, yeah, that's right, those are cotan. So I'm gonna do y over x just so I get tangent because I'm used to it. So when I do that, I get again, PSN over PSN, those cancel. And that's gonna equal, let's see, the momentum of the electron divided by the momentum of the neutrino. And then we can go ahead and solve for theta. Does that part make sense so far? Yeah. And then once you get theta, what would you do? Inverse tangent. Um, you're gonna do inverse tangent, good, to get theta, but once you get theta, I'm saying, like once you solve for theta, say it's 25 degrees or whatever it turns out to be. Um, I guess you could put the value back into the original equation. Yeah, either one, very good. So theta will equal some number, right? And take that number and plug it in either there or plug it in there. And that'll allow you to solve for the momentum of the second nucleus, PSN. So this is kind of the opposite of the truck problem. Do you remember the truck problem was where we did this, where it was like the truck was coming in, the car was coming in, they collided and they went off at an angle? Yeah. So this is the opposite of that. We're taking something stationary and it's exploding. Two things going off at angles. Well, the third one has to balance that at that other angle. Do you see what I mean, how it's similar in nature? 
Yeah. So the key here is when you see something that says um, they explode at right angles to make one of them along the X and one of them along the Y to simplify things for you. The thing, how do you choose which one is going along the Y and which one is going along the X? Does it really matter when you think about space? Like what's up and what's down really in space, right? Like, honestly, think about yeah. that for a second. If I call the neutrino and the Y and the electron and the X, well, now theta is going to be the complementary angle. It's going to be instead of like 35 degrees, it'll be 55 degrees as an answer. But the second... I think I see what I, I've done wrong. Because in the original equation, when you have like zero equals P neutrino plus zero minus PSN cosine theta, I didn't do minus there. If you don't do minus, what'll happen is you'll get a negative answer for PSN, which indicates that your sign initially should have been the opposite. That's all that's gonna yeah. change. So you might get the opposite of the answer that we would get through this method, but it would still technically work because the problem says determine the magnitude and direction. So the direction is really indicated by theta. The magnitude is indicated by the value PSN. Right. Um, trying to think of what else yeah that's the approach i would take for this problem it's definitely a difficult problem because i don't think we've really pushed the two-dimensional stuff and two-dimensional is not really a huge topic in honors it's more of an ap topic i just wanted to introduce you guys to it so i wouldn't be as concerned about it but i would think about the fact that when you're told things move at right angles those angles are up to you to choose which one is on the x and which is on the y yeah i think i was able to do it i just got like really mixed up with the signs um but like 47 i found myself with like a bunch of extra variables that like were not so all right let me go to 47 now give me one moment um mr howell yes what does psn stand for in the uh i use that as the momentum of the second nucleus of the second nucleus okay yeah and I'm just calling it SN because they didn't give it another name, right? They said the second recoiling, recoiling, by the way, means coming back. So when those other two are shot off like this at right angles, this one comes back off. It's like the recoil of a gun when you fire. Right. Um, all right, let me pull up this picture. Hold on, guys, so I can take an image of it. Uh, I got to change this. 47, right? Okay. All right, so let's take a look. I'm gonna guess right off the bat without even looking that this is tough because it's probably nothing with numbers, right? Yeah, it looks like M and 2M already. Uh, all right, so an atomic nucleus of mass M traveling with speed V collides elastically. Right off the bat, that's a key word there, right? We know that no kinetic energy is gonna be lost. So that's gonna be our third equation that we're probably gonna to wanna to use here. So right off the bat, think about that, right? Kinetic energy initially equals kinetic energy final. It collides elastically with a target particle of mass 2m that's initially at rest and is scattered at 90 degrees. Okay. At what angle does the target particle move after the collision? What are the final speeds of the two particles? What fraction of the kinetic energy is transferred to the target particle? Okay. Um, all right, let me first analyze this scattering phrase. What do they mean by that? Tommy, is that, is that what stopped you right away, Jack? The scattering uh, piece? That definitely like held me up for a while, just trying to draw a diagram for it. Atomic nucleus mass M, traveling speed V, collides with a target particle and is scattered at 90 degrees. Okay, so here's how I'm interpreting it. And the only way I can, the, the reason I'm interpreting it this way, by the way, is this is the only way you can solve it. So I'm like trying to think of like, what, how can you solve this? What are they getting at? So here's my image of before. Okay, that's before collision. And this is what I'm seeing after. 
I'm seeing the fact that it says it is scattered, they're referring to the atomic nucleus of mass M. That's what they're referring to that has been scattered. And the word scattered here, I think they actually mean just redirected. Yeah. So now after the collision, we've got the mass M moving up like that. Mm -hmm. See 90 degrees, it was going this way and then scattered meaning redirected upward. It's yeah. like when two pool balls collide um, at an angle. And then it says, let's see, at what angle does the target particle move? So we don't know what direction the target particle, we know it's going to move right. Like, can we agree with that for, off the bat? Yeah. Um, and it's likely going to also move down. Would you agree with that also? Yeah. Down and to the right. Do you, what's the logic behind my argument there? You got to balance out the Y because there's no Y momentum before the collision? Correct. So before the collision, there's all X momentum and it's all going to the right. And then suddenly there's no X momentum for that nucleus. So that means that the heavier mass has to go to the right. Again, it started by going to the right here. Then the lighter, the attacking nucleus is going upward. It can't just go from having all X to having all Y, and then there's no X momentum to make up for what it lost. So this guy's got to have X momentum to make up for what it lost. It's got to have Y momentum to counteract the positive Y momentum of the first particle. So already I know a general direction. Okay, I know a general direction. I don't really know much more than that, though, at this point. All right, let's move this slightly real quick so I can put an angle in here. Okay, so it says part A, at what angle does the target particle move after the collision? So pretty much they're asking us find theta in the diagram. Then part B, what are the final speeds of the two particles? So at that point, we're looking for VA and VB. We'll call that VA initial for the other one, okay? Um, so theta, VA, and VB is what we're looking for. And then part C is really interesting. It says, what fraction of the initial kinetic energy is transferred to the target particle? So that doesn't mean we have to find the kinetic energies. All we're asked for is what fraction of it. So we'll address that in a moment. We'll see how we can get a fractional form. All right, so I've got the before, I've got the after. Let me start looking at my directions now, okay? I don't think I know anything else, right? No, I'm just writing sure. And this, oh, sorry, they called that V. So let me get rid of VA zero there because that was technically called V in the problem right here. So I'm gonna call that V down here, right? I'm gonna go back to V. I, I enabled that VAO for a minute, but just to be consistent with the problem. What the hell, hold on. There we go. All right. Uh, 90 degrees, perfect. So in the x direction and then in the y direction, momentum before equals momentum after. So beforehand, what x momenta do we have? Um, only the um, m object, just one m. Good. And what is that velocity traveling at? Uh, just v. Very I guess. good. Yep. The second mass is not moving before the collision. After the collision, that momentum from the first particle is gone in the x direction, right? Do we all see that that's gone there? Like it, it doesn't exist anymore. It's only moving up now. So the red vector at that angle is what we care about. Its mass is 2m. Well, I could put a zero first, by the way, for the first particle. Its mass is 2m. Its speed is vb and the angle is theta. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, so it's it's cosine theta like always just because it's for the x part. Correct, the x component means we're really, really looking at this right here. See that blue vector I just drew in there? Right. Okay, that one right there. That's what we're really looking at. That's what VB cosine theta actually is. We could call that VBX if we want, and that's fine. We did that, if you remember, for one of the problems. We called it VBX, and then later on, we figured out theta. For now, I'm going to leave it as VB cosine theta. If we run into an issue, then maybe I'll come back and say, ooh, let's actually instead call that VBX to make life easier. Right. Uh, in the Y direction, and that'll come about, by the way, if we start to realize we have too many unknowns. Okay. In the Y direction, before the collision occurred, there's nothing, right? 
it's only moving the X. So this is a fat zero here. Then after the collision, we've got the mass of the particle that's attacking as M. Its velocity is unknown, but it's all in the Y direction. So we can say that's just VA. I don't need to use VA sine theta because this particle up here, right, is only moving in the Y direction. So I don't have to look at a component of its value. I look at the full value because it's moving in the direction specified. Then we put a minus sign because the other one's got to move down. If this one moves up after the collision, the other one has to move down. And it's the same exact equation or same exact expression, but using sine theta now. What's the convenience here? What happens in both equations? Um, the second part on the right-hand side, they're both the same, but one's negative. So if you add them together, I guess they just cancel out or? Cosine no, and sine? Because there's the cosine and sine, so that doesn't. It's okay. What else happens? Try to find it. Makes life easier on us. It's the, uh, the M's everywhere. M drops off. Yeah. Right? So M is here and M is here. M is here and M is here. Now remember, a term like zero has M in it technically. I know that's weird because it's like zero, but zero M is still zero, isn't it? So yeah. it's weird, but think of these as having M in them as well and the M's all cancel out. Okay, whenever you're in doubt with that, because some students still have trouble like seeing that. Like, oh, there's only M's on the right-hand side. The left-hand side is zero. How does the M drop off? Well, technically you're factoring M out in front and then you're dividing it onto the other side and zero divided by M is still zero. So the M drops off right away, and that helps us a little bit. So that gives us an equation for here of V equals 2VB cosine theta. And here we get 0 equals VA minus 2VB sine theta. Yeah. OK. All right, let's see what else we can do now. So the elastic nature of the collision will help us with the kinetic energy portion and we're probably going to want to use that right now. I think we're going to actually have to. Now keep in mind we cannot use that simplified form of the kinetic energy equation when it's two-dimensional collisions. With the one-dimensional collisions, you guys remember, I simplified the kinetic energy formula. We did all the substitutions to make it like, you know, VA minus VB equals VA after minus VB after. And I made it like, like, oh, this is great. We don't have to worry about squaring. But that is not the case for two-dimensional collisions. So what we want to do now is write down our conservation of kinetic energy next. And the reason I'm saying that is because look at many unknowns we have, right? VA is unknown. VB is unknown. Theta is unknown. Yeah, that's and the action. problem I ran into. And V I, is unknown also, right, Jack? Yeah, because I, oh, I isolated right. theta, but then everything that theta equaled was unknown. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Okay, so let's think about what else we can do then. It may be useful to call them VBX and VBY for now. I don't know if that would help. It would just make them two unknowns instead of, oh, no, but then it would still be two unknowns, right? Because V, oh, no, that's, yeah, that would actually help. Right? Because think about it. Right now we have, let's, let's highlight real quick. We've got one unknown, a second unknown, a third unknown, and then a fourth unknown. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if I replace VB cosine theta with VBX, I'm making one unknown there. And if I replace VB sine theta with VBY, that's another unknown. Where, oh no, never mind. Still two unknowns, replacing two unknowns, I guess. Because VB is one unknown, and then theta is another unknown. So yeah, that wouldn't really help much. Okay, so let's look and think. Let's go to the conservation of kinetic energy and see if that helps at all. Maybe that'll help us to solve for something a little bit earlier. We've got one half in the beginning, the mass of the object moving, which is m, its velocity squared, and that's it before the collision. Okay, again, before the collision occurs, this is the kinetic energy portion now. That's what we have before the collision occurs. Only one particle moving with mass m and speed v. After the collision, we know that 
the mass of m is still moving, but with a new velocity, right? A new velocity va, and that's moving the one that's moving north, and that's squared. And then the second mass is now moving with velocity vb squared. This is nice because we have an equation now without theta in it, right? Remember that theta is not involved with kinetic energy problems at all. We're looking at the speed of the particle, so we're just looking at VB overall, not VB sine theta, not VB cosine theta. It's not like we do the kinetic energy balance and the X and the Y separately. It's just a general kinetic energy balance. What will happen again is the mass will drop off, which is convenient, but we still, and let's drop off the one halves also, how about, all right? But we still look like we have three unknowns here. All right, that's what that equation becomes. You can't drop off the squared, right? Unfortunately, we can't. You can only do that if everything is multiplied. Now, we could square root both sides, but the right-hand side would be the square root of that whole thing. Yeah. The left-hand side we could drop off if we square root it, but still, three unknowns. So, well, no, four unknowns, rather. We made <sighs> Pythagoras to get the angle. I know, like, they're all separate things. I think that's a good idea. Let's think about that for a second, right? Let's see what we've got here. Hold on. <sighs> Can we do anything Pythagorean theorem? Um, both separate parts, like the V squareds before the VA squareds going vertically and the VB squareds going like southeast. But since it looks like the same as the uh, like Pythagorean like uh, theorem, like maybe we could get the angle like that. Well, what we could do if we wanted to is we could say that like VBX squared plus VBY squared equals VB squared, which tells us that VB cosine theta squared plus VB sine theta squared equals VB squared. This is a fourth equation, right? Yeah. So it does help us because we now have four equations. Let's, I'm going to zoom out slightly. Okay, let's highlight our four useful equations here. Equation one, equation two, equation three, and equation four. So four equations, four unknowns, this would probably be the way to go about solving now. Am I saying that's an easy solution? No, I'm not saying that by any means. <laughs> probably going to be a very messy solution actually. Um, let's try to figure out if there's a way to make life work a bit easier for us though. Hmm. What's the best step to, so and by the way at this point in time this is where substitution is the way to go unless you can see something else that could happen much easier. Um, and I don't see that right away, something else that's simpler like dividing the equations you know or using elimination something like that. Um, so I think, go ahead, Jack. Yeah. Something I see is if you get so the square root of VA squared plus two VB squared that mm -hmm. equals two VB cosine theta because it's both V on one side and you just need to take the square root of it. Hmm. Say that one more time. Go ahead. I'm going to write it as you say it. So two VB cosine theta equals the square root of VA squared plus two VB squared. And what equation is that coming from? So in the, in the first of the equations, V equals two VB cosine theta. Okay, I see that. And then you just take the square root of VA squared plus two VB squared. Okay, I like that. But we still have three unknowns in that equation, right? Yeah, so it doesn't really help. But it does. It, it kind of breaks things down a little bit, but I like what you're doing. So what Jack was saying was plugging this expression in for V and then solving that. Okay, that could work. Mm, well, it at least gets rid of V, right? We noticed that? And we don't need little V. That was the unknown variable or unknown value to start. So I do like that, Jack. So what this will do is we now have new equations. We now have equations. So this equation is now gone in a sense, right? Because we've used it. Yeah. 
So we now have equations, let's use green. We now still have this equation here. We now have this new equation right here, right? And now this one is gone with me. I'm crossing off the ones that we've substituted into and highlighting the ones that are the new resulting equations. And I think it's still this one here, right? That we still have as well? Yeah. So it looks like our green equations are our important equations now. Okay, I like that. Whereas a moment ago we had four equations, four unknowns. So one down, all right, nice, it's a process. How do we get rid of the second one now? Let's see, look at the three equations and see if we can do anything with them. Um, so if we solve for the, uh, the one where it says zero equals VA minus two VB sine theta, if we solve that, so it's VA equals two VB sine theta, just like added to the other side, then we could substitute the substitute VA into where it's the square root of it. I like it. Janice, does that make sense what he's saying? Um, Take a look what I'm writing here. He's saying solve this one here, right, for VA. Yeah. And then take that and plug it into this new equation we have here, which at least gets rid of VA. Does it get rid of VA in all equations? It does, right? Yes, it does. So then... Wanna highlight our new equations then? Hold on one sec. So that as a result of moving gets rid of this one here. Let's put an X through it again. That's gone. And it gets rid of this one here. That's gone. So let's use a new color. Let's use blue now. So we now have this equation here. And we, hold on, what else do we have? This equation here still, right? Yeah. It looks like the two equations in blue are what we have now. Um, something I'm seeing we can do Go ahead. is that um, that one equation on the bottom could also be 2VB cosine theta squared equals 2VB sine theta squared. Oh, yeah. 2VB squared. I like that. I like that. Have like almost the same thing besides the sine and cosine on both sides. So you could cross some stuff out. <coughs> I hope it's not the exact same thing though. Cause then we get yeah. what's called the redundancy. Is it the exact same thing actually? No. Cause the sine theta versus cosine theta, I think. Okay. Let's see. By the way, this 2VB squared at the end, was that the whole thing squared or just the VB was squared? Where did that come uh, from? Let's go back up and work our way. What do you think? Just the VB. <laughs> See, now you gotta know where the hell it came from, right? <laughs> um, I think it's just the VB also, I agree, but let's see to make sure. Where did we get that equation from? Got that from the one above. Got that from the one above that. Yeah. It is. It is. It, is. it came from up here. I see it right there, right? That's where it came from initially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, isn't that, it's hard to track this back. Okay. So we now, let's use red at this point. We now have this equation here, and we still have this one right here in red, right? Those are the two that we're really focusing on now. They do look um very similar, but they're not. They're not. You're right. They're not because we have a subtraction versus an addition, and we have a 4, a 4, four right? and a 2. So it's not like it's a 2, 2, 2, right? On the bottom equation, it's going to be 4, 4, 2, actually, when you think about it. Is there a way we could divide it? Uh, the problem we're going to run into with division right now is that, let's see, 
the left hand side would divide nicely, but the side that has a sum on it is not going to divide nicely. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when we use that division technique I showed you guys, you really just want one term on each side or at least something that would reduce. Now it's possible that this would reduce actually a little bit, but I would recommend that we use substitution at this point, even though it is really messy because whether we solve for theta or, oh, duh, never mind. At this point, we have how many unknowns? Two unknowns, two equations. Ah, okay. Find the intersection of the two oh, different did. curves. And it, so as soon as you get down to a two by two system, especially when it's squared, I would graph it and find the solution graphically actually. Now we could absolutely solve it algebraically. It would just be really messy, right? Yeah. I'm looking at the, um, the equation on the bottom. Uh -huh. Like if you subtract the, uh, the two VB sine theta squared uh -huh. from both sides, then it would be um, 2VB cosine theta squared minus 2VB sine theta squared equals 2VB squared. I'm with you. And then using the other equation, it looks like... Here's the other equation. I'm writing it down. It's a plus though, right? Right. Okay, so those are our two equations at this point, right? Right, yeah, yeah. So I'm copying down, all I did was copy down what was in red at this point. I mean, we could divide the whole first equation by two, but it will still yield some things because that's really a four when you think about it, you know? Yeah. It's really two squared, like this two here is two squared, that's a two squared. So those will become fours. And then there'll be a two on the right-hand side, so we could reduce it all by that factor if that would help. So this is the first equation. Whoops, a minus, not a plus. This is the first equation rewritten. I squared the twos and then I divided the whole equation by two. So this was originally a four, right? This was a four here, this is a four, and this was a two. And then I divided this by two, divide this by two, divide this by two. So those are all gone now. Could you now do division? Um, so you could, and the right-hand side would just become a one, right? Yeah. yeah. But the left-hand side, and it would just be messy. I mean, we could also just set the equations equal to each other because they're both equal to VB squared, right? So oh, we could yeah. set this expression equal to this expression at this point. Yeah, but what yeah. would that yield for us? That would yield a system, or that would yield one equation with two unknowns still, wouldn't it? Yeah. See what I'm saying? Like X and theta are unknowns in this problem. So we would still have X unknown, or V, VB, whatever, unknown, and we would still have theta unknown at this point. Likely, VB is in every term. Actually, VB squared would be in every term, so that would cancel, right? Yeah. All right, so let's do it algebraically. I like this. We'll do it with the calculator in a moment to, to verify, but let's do it algebraically. So let's set the equations equal to each other or divide them by each other. Same difference, really, in the end now. So I'm going to set the first equation, and watch what I'm going to do with the first equation. I'm going to square everything at this point. So that's the first equation really, without the VB squared on the right. And then I'm gonna set that equal to the second equation, I should say expression really.
So far, so good? Yeah. VB squared is in all terms. Do you know what cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals? Oh, uh, no. It's a, it's a trig identity. I don't think you've yeah, learned it yet. I was going to say, I think we have learned some of these trig identities. It's a Pythagorean identity. Oh, is it just um, like one? Or it something? is. Yeah, good. Yeah. It's just one. Cosine, think of cosine as x and think of sine as y. x squared plus y squared equals r squared, and r is the vector of the unit circle. That's the one. So this will become a one. Nice work with this, guys. This is good. Factor out a two. Is that is that also a trig identity? Unfortunately, yeah. cosine squared minus sine squared is not a trig identity. But you can replace either cosine or sine with one minus the other squared. That's a trig right. identity you can use. So watch what I'm going to do next. I'm going to say I'll leave the cosine there. I'm going to replace sine squared theta with one minus cosine squared theta. And that comes from the Pythagorean identity, the exact same one. If cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta from up here was equal to one, then we know that one minus cosine squared theta is by definition sine squared theta. So I'm replacing what's underlined in red with what's underlined in red below. And now it's just a messy problem here. We have a minus minus, obviously, so that's a plus. Let's keep going. The angle is going to end up being like 30 or 60, watch, because I'm seeing a one half already. Yeah. You see that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm already starting to think it's going to be that. Or maybe actually it might be a one quarter, actually. Yeah, it's going to be a one quarter because this is going to be cosine squared theta minus one plus cosine squared theta, right? I have to think of the double negative that's occurring there. That's what that'll become. Because again, I'm taking, I, I can't point actually with this thing. I'm taking this, right? And this and combining like terms. And that's really a plus when I see it. Yeah. This negative is getting distributed to both of these terms. Now we can divide by two. We can add one. We can divide by two. We can square root. And look at that, guys. What's the angle? Oh, God. It's one of your, it's one of your standards. Or 60. Yeah, it's 30. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, look at all the work though this takes. What was that? Three, four pages to solve one problem. And again, that's because we did it analytically at the end. But personally, the way I would do it, when we got to the point where we had two values right here, see the red equations, both one circled, one highlighted, I'd plug them right in the calculator and you could solve for theta and for VB. I, I could show you how to do that if you want to see. So what would you say is X and Y? When you Doesn't matter. Either one. You pick whichever one. Theta is X and VB is Y or vice versa. You pick. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. You could just. Now, you'd have to solve for Y in both cases. So I would probably call VB the Y value. Although, actually, now that I look at this, you're going to have Y with a Y inside of it. So actually, graphically, you wouldn't be able to solve this, I'm thinking. See what I mean? Like, if I call this Y, uh, I'm, I'm pointing with my mouse, as if you can see it. Sorry. I'm on the computer looking. Um, here, I'm going to use orange and circle it. If I call this Y, right, and I solve it for Y by square rooting both sides, I'm going to have Y within the solution for Y. Like, it'll say Y equals the square root of Y cosine X squared. See what I mean? These would all be Ys here. Are so you, to do that for like you can't, relation? no. A relation can't have a dependent value within the dependent value. So you can never say like X equals one plus X. It doesn't make oh, sense yeah. to say that because it's a contradiction. You would get zero equals one, right? If I, if I wrote literally this statement right here, that's a contradiction because if I 
subtract x on both sides, I get 0 equals 1. And that's not a true statement. Yeah. So the only time that would be useful is if you had like a recursive sequence where it's like x equals 1 plus x sub n, meaning the next n or the next x, but that's different. Yeah. So it turns out, actually, I'm kind of glad we did this algebraically because if we tried to do it on the graph, we would have gotten to a point where we'd have been like, wait, y equals uh, cosine x times y? How could you have that in the answer for it? Yeah. So it, it turns out this cannot be solved graphically. So once you get theta though, which took a lot of work, then the rest should be pretty easy because if you know theta, you got to start going back to each equation and say, all right, which equation can I find now? Well, look at either of these ones circled in red. If we knew theta, we could then solve for VB, right? Yeah. In either of the red equations at this point. Yeah. So which one you want to do? The top red equation or the bottom one? How about the top one? All right, because it's already solved for VB with the squared there. That sounds good. Yeah. All right, VB cos squared, maybe sine squared equals VB squared. Right, let's do that at the bottom. I'm going to add it down here now. So VB cos theta squared plus VB sine theta squared equal VB squared. So it's going to be VB root 3 over 2 squared plus VB 1 half squared equal VB squared. We get VB squared equals, oh, not equals, VB squared times what, 3 fourths plus yeah. VB squared times 1 fourth. Uh, actually, what is this going to yield, guys? <laughs> is it... Is it just going to be one? You could cancel out VB. Yeah. Oh, uh, no. Like, that doesn't help us, right? No. Because then we get one equals one, which is great, and that's awesome, but it doesn't help us to solve that one. So it looks like we're going to have to use another equation. That one didn't work, right? Yeah. Does that makes sense, what I'm saying, though? Yeah. All right, let's find another one. Let's see. What about the bottom one in red there? Would that work? I think it would. Yeah. See this one here? Let's plug, yeah. in, our, let's plug in our 30 into this guy. I think it'll work. I don't know. Do anyone see you guys seeing the reason it wouldn't work there? Not at a glance. I'm going to erase the theta real quick and put a 30 in for each of those. I'm then going to keep evaluating this. So this is going to be 4 VB squared times the cosine of 30 is radical 3 over 2 squared, which is 3 fourths, equals 4 VB squared, 1 half squared is 1 fourth, plus 2 VB squared. Uh-oh. Are we going to get to the same issue again? Uh, yeah, I think we derived the first equation from this one. I know, so it looks like it's going to be redundancy. Let's see, force cancel, force cancel. 3VB squared equals 1VB squared plus 2VB squared. Yeah. yeah, so this is not going to help us to get a solution. So clearly, we can't use these two equations together to get it. All right. That's odd. I'm surprised we can't use... I wonder why we can't use either of those two. got to think about that more. All right, let's find another one that makes sense. So this statement is not right. Um, what about these other equations back in the beginning here? How about these? Anything we can do with them? Um, when I solved it, I had the equation VB equals uh, the first little V divided by two cosine theta. And we could like substitute something in for the V. Okay. Solve for that. Where are we looking though, Jack? Where where did you have that? Oh, uh, we didn't do it. It came from the X momentum. From the X oh, momentum. Yeah. You start with the V equals two VB cosine theta. 
I see. Right here you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Now, if we take that and plug in for theta, we now have little v unknown and vb unknown. Keep going. And we have v equals the square. Oh, wait, because then that's va. I think we're going down a very similar. <laughs> um, would it be this one we'd plug into? Let's see. If we know theta here, va and vb would unknown in this one. We got theta, which is nice. That worked out well. It seems like plugging into either of the red equations, we get no solution or we get a redundancy that tells us VB equals VB. Is there a way we could use um, uh, the, like the special triangle? Cause it would be 30, 60, 90. And then we, we know the ratios of each like side. It's a really good question, Jack. Um, to know, to figure out VB and then VBX and VBY you're talking about? Yeah, because we know the, um, we could find the slope of the VB because we have the angle. And then since it's just um, 30, 90, 60. The problem is we don't have VBX or VBY. So right now, Jack, you're talking about this. Right, that's what you're talking about? Right, and then Go ahead. 90 degrees and 60 degrees. But yeah, I guess that doesn't. It doesn't really give us much more information. That's what I'm saying, you know? Like it's still the same three unknowns. Because my thought was that since it's um, two, one, and root three, we make VBX equal um, root three, VB equal two, and VBY equal one. <sighs> I see what you're saying, like a proportion based on the 30, 60, 90? Yeah. I'm not sure that helps though. No, no, I like the idea. Because um, then VB sine 30 equals one, VB cosine uh, 30 equals um, root three, and then we just find VB. Sine 30 is the short. So short is always one, then you double, no, you double short to get to long, to get to hypotenuse, and you multiply short by radical three to get to longer side. So you're saying VB sine theta, which is VBY, times. Because then we'd have only VBs if we put like, but then. That's a good idea. I think that's going to work, right? Because then we have theta. We have theta's 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, let me think for a sec, Jack. I think you're on the right track, what you're saying. Let me just write this out properly. I'm thinking of my triangles from geometry. So this is x. This guy is always x radical 3, right? And this guy is 2x. Is that the ratios? Yeah. So if we instead have vb being x, then VBY is half X and VBX is half X root three. Half VB root three. And what does that do for us though? Because we're really trying to find VB, not VBX or VBY. We're just getting another equation with VB on both sides that I feel like is just gonna it's an, I think it's going to be another redundancy yeah. because of the fact that if you think about this problem, every 30, 60, 90 is proportionally larger or smaller. So like if VB were seven, then those numbers are different. If VB were eight, those numbers are different. So until we know VBX and VBY, we can't really use that idea to get VB. Like oh, yeah. if I know this X is equal to six, right? Then this guy is going to be 12. But if this were 12, then this guy is now 24 but we definitely can use another equation. I think we need to use one of the earlier equations right now. Let's see. This one introduces a relationship between V and VB because we know theta. This introduces a relationship between VA and VB because we know theta. Uh, Let me copy 
get those down real quick. There's got to be some little tidbit that we're not seeing here. Okay, I got that one. Uh, then we got this guy right here. And we know theta in both these cases. We have equations with those three already together. What is that but, equation? Um, v squared equals VA squared plus two VB squared. The whole quantity or just the VB like that? Uh, just the VB. Okay. Where did that one come from, Jack? Earlier? Yes. Um, I'm looking for it. The kinetic uh, equation. Oh, so right here. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like one, two, three. All right. Those three equations I just circled, those are the ones we're using? Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at those three then. Let's slide these down. So now that we've got theta gone, we should definitely be able to solve this because it's three variables, three equations. So let's see. Well, are we going to be able to? I guess we will. Yeah. Let's plug this guy in, right? Let's plug that expression in for this right here, like we did before to get rid of V. We did that already once. Mm And then this other expression is still going to be the same, VA equals 2VB sine 30, okay? So those are our new two equations. And this is just VA and VB, so theoretically it should work, but <laughs> I'm concerned that if we plug in for VA now, where VB is, Let's see, now we would take like this expression here, guys, right? And plug that into right here to make it easiest. All right, so this guy right there. Yeah. Going in here, my concern is that we're gonna again yield a solution that's gonna be trivial. Let's see if that's true or not. With me so far where I got that last equation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then this becomes 4 VB cos 30 again is going to be radical 3 over 2. So that's going to be 3 fourths. It's a 4, not a 2. I think we we did this. Uh, Are we getting the same? Of this equation. All right, we got this a little while ago. Yeah. The fours cancel, right? Fours cancel, yeah. And it becomes again, three equals one plus two. Something with the, um, the special triangle from earlier though. So since VB cosine theta is equivalent to root three, VB sine theta is one and VB is just two. Um, something that's, uh, so VA is two VB sine 30. So I guess for part C, we can get the fraction for the energy. Because VA is 2 VB sine 30. Just from up there. Okay. But how are we getting the velocities of these then? All right, didn't we need, what was the very beginning here? We needed the, we got part A. Part B is what are the final speeds of the two particles? So we still need VA and VB as numbers, don't we? 
Oh, right. Okay. I guess the fraction then doesn't work. I wonder if part B, let me, I've, I've refused to look at the solution so far. I just want to see if part B's answer is a number or if it's in terms of little v, maybe. The, the, this question, there's no answer for it on Slater. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So it's possible there's a mistake in the problem, but let me, let me pull it up. Let me see and see what you guys see. And I, I refuse personally to do this one at the time, but now I'm thinking that it's possible that the answer itself might have little v in it. And it might not be a numerical solution for part B, but it wouldn't make sense, right? They would say in terms of V and yeah. the final speeds. So that's a bit confusing. Let's see. Is this what AP physics is going to be like? <laughs> it actually is. I mean, that's the kind of questions like where we spend, you know, a while on one problem and have to go through the, the right. uh, arithmetic and algebra involved. This is chapter seven, right? Yeah. Number 47. The worst is when it's like, oh, that's all it was? Really? <laughs> yeah, I hope the answer is not like one or something. No, like it's that. what we expected. It's in terms of little v. Are you kidding me? Yep. A is 30 degrees. We are 100% right. Okay. Part B says that VB is little v over radical three for VB final. And VA final is also little v over radical three but they're in terms of little v, that's the problem. Had it said that, we would have made our answer in terms of that. Yeah. yeah. Crap. Ugh. All right, let's go back to figure out which equations we would have used to get that then. So we'll definitely use this guy right here, right? That'll give us vb right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so let's copy. That's really annoying. See, that's what makes this problem tough. And I guarantee you that's why there's no solution on Slater because people probably tried to do the problem and realized, oh, you know what? You can't get an answer for part B. That doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, that's really dumb. Traditionally, books will say in terms of, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> But we at least proved that it wasn't solvable, right? That was the concept yeah. that we were getting to. And we got um, 30 degrees, so. Yep, for part okay. A. Yeah. Okay, so let me paste this down here. So this is the easy one to plug right into. So V equals two VB cosine 30, 30 degrees is root three over two. Two is cancel. Yep, and it's exactly what the book has. V over root three. That's really dumb. That's really dumb, sorry. I'm surprised that the book did this. That's definitely a mistake. They should have that in there. Um, and then we could plug into the other equation. What is another equation that we had to get VA? Um, what about this guy right here, right? Let's use that one next. Yep. All right, so let's highlight this one here. Or actually, is it even solved? It's already solved for VA on the side. Let's use this one right here. It's the same equation, right? Just resolved. So I'm going to use that one instead. Oh, and then we could substitute in the, um, the value we just got. Exactly. So VA equals 2. VB is V over root 3. And sine of 30. Sine of 30 is 1 half. So VA equals 2 times V over root 3 times 1 half. The 1 half and the 2 cancel. So VA equals, again, the same thing, V over root 3. Does that make sense? Yep. Janice? Yeah. Okay. And then the final part, let's actually look at the final part, because this part I think I – is the most important because what we'll notice here is that they're asking you for a fraction, right? So you know that it's not going to be in terms of, well, <laughs> we would know the last one we didn't think was going to be in terms of, but because it's asking for a fraction, there's a good chance what's going to end up happening. It'll cancel out in the numerator and denominator. Exactly. 
Exactly. So the question says, find the fraction of energy transferred, right? The fraction transferred. Um, so what we want to think about, let's see, how do we figure out the fraction transferred? All of the kinetic energy in the beginning was yeah. object A, right? Yeah. So if we're looking at the fraction transferred to B, it would be um, the kinetic energy of object A beforehand as the total energy in the system, right? Object A was the only thing moving before this collision. So its kinetic energy is really the total energy that we started the problem with. And then object B, we're looking at its kinetic energy after the collision. We are not looking at objects A's kinetic energy after the collision because if we did that, what would the answer just be? One over what would it be? One. It'd be one, yeah. This is the total energy after the collision. This is the total energy before the collision. So if we do that, it's just gonna be one. We wanna know the fraction of the original energy that was sent into object B. So if we look at objects B's kinetic energy after the collision, so this is gonna equal one half. Now, what are the masses? <sighs> object B was double object A, right? Yeah. Times its velocity after the collision all over object A times its velocity before the collision squared. So then do we substitute the V divided by root three into one of them? So let's see, VAO is just V, isn't it? Right. Because we know that before the collision occurred, this was just called V. So that one is definitely a V there, I agree. M is there and the one half is there. And then yes, just like you said, Jack, this is going to be VB, which was V over radical three squared. So the one half drop off, which I should have canceled in the last step, I guess, right? The masses drop off. And you could distribute the uh, squared to V squared drops off. Very good. So the numerator we're left with is a two, V squared over three, all over V squared. And yes, the V squareds now drop off. So what are we left with, guys? Sixth. Careful. Sixth, I think. Uh, not a six, no. Oh, two thirds? Two thirds. So, no big deal, just a six page problem for one problem, you know? <laughs> But that's kind of the mentality with AP physics you're going to notice next year that like there's going to be problems that take us three, four pages to get to a final solution. And a lot of the time it is stuff like this where the algebraic solution is just so lengthy. Um, now, just to give you a little maybe feeling of comfort, A, you would never be asked for a, a problem on an AP exam is never going to be this long because you would run out of time. Um, but later in life when you're doing things, if you're working as an engineer, you would not solve this algebraically. You would use a computer. Remember I said earlier, like graphically, they can't handle putting Y inside of Y, a computer can. So if you give a computer like a MATLAB system, four equations with four unknowns and run what's called a solver for it, it can solve it itself. And it will use other methods of substitution, elimination, all along the way to get to a solution. So it's, it's rare that people are gonna do this by hands. Now in engineering school, or if you're studying anything to do with science and math, you'll probably have problems that will be this lengthy and in depth. You're never going to do that solution by hand, you know, later in life. But knowing how to do it, you know, could be important if you're a coder one day because the coders have to know how to do it by hand so they can then code programs to solve it, on a, you know, with the, with the computer instead.
It's so nothing this hard on a test for AP physics. <laughs> yeah, I mean this this lengthy, I would say. You know, the yeah. concept, the ideas, definitely, but the, the yeah. lengthiness of this problem is ridiculous, and the specificity of part C or B, whatever that was, saying that it's in terms of V would make the problem a lot easier to recognize because we were getting solutions that were trivial over and over and over for a right. reason, and that reason led us to recognize that oh, the author must have been looking for an answer in terms of little v. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Uh, I wouldn't be concerned about this, obviously, right now, like I was saying, and you're not having a test on Chapter 7, but good to see a problem like this in its full entirety. Were there other ones you had problems on, or were these only two? Uh, these were the two for me that were tricky. Yeah, same. Okay. All right. Nice, guys. I enjoyed this. It was a good conversation. These problems are fun. It, it, at the end, it's kind of like rewarding, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's very fulfilling. Because yeah. at first, like, we had, what, like six equations, I think? And we just, like, narrowed it down, so that was nice. Yeah, and keeping track of your stuff is really important, too. You know what I mean? As you go through the process, yeah. knowing which equation comes. So even though I use colors here on a test when you don't have a colored pencil, use numbers. You right. know, label the equations as you get through them. Equation one, equation two, equation three. So later on, you could say, oh, I did two times equation one plus equation two. So I can yeah. see later on the, you know, the steps that I used. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, thanks a lot, Mr. Howell. All right, guys. Yeah. Very helpful. Okay. I'll see you guys on, no, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Tomorrow yeah. afternoon. Okay, guys. I'll see you then. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You're welcome.